to really instill in the team is that you're doing this with them and not without them. Because they need to realize that they cannot be everywhere and that's the reason you're doing this. The second, the second part to that is also looking at as soon as you have the right person, uh, the senior person really needs to relinquish and let them run with it and go on to so and solve the other problems because there are plenty of problems to be solved in a startup. And uh, being present uh, everywhere is not essential once you have hired the right person. So really key to having a good startup is hiring the right person and building, building the team ground up with the highly talented person so you can actually hand over doing the things that you are doing and move on to doing something else so that the team can grow as well as the organization can grow. Thank you, Makaran. Uh, by the way, Makaran uh, was GM Engineering and Technology at uh, Gemstone uh, Systems, which was acquired by VMware. Currently, he is Senior Director at VMware, leading the development of data management products in the cloud application uh, platform initiative at VMware. So now let us hear from Prashant Karnik. Uh, the team uh, that you build in a startup can progress from startup to a growth company and then to a mature company. So do you think a uh, team will stay irrespective of whether they make uh, or not make financial gains? Well, I think uh, the reality is um, not every startup succeeds. Um, if you look at the team, um, as some of my colleagues here have pointed out, it, they usually stay with you for a sense of purpose. And if the purpose is, it can be a variety of ways. I mean, yes, money is a good motivator, but it is not the only motivator. So, um, in my experience, some of the people get extremely excited with seeing customer success. And they say success after success after success, um, the company I, I used to work for, our stock price fell about 70% in, in a matter of three years because of financial meltdown. We hardly had any attrition because we were still doing work with large banks, such as Lloyd, Citibank, Chase Manhattan. And that specific um, environment, I think, is um, to some, some aspect habit forming. You go from one bank to another bank and you just see these successes. And people believe, I mean, it's not a question of existence. Um, you still make it. <coughs> but that purpose that you're solving a real-life problem, for example, the company I work for, R40 in life was credit card processing software. So when you can tell somebody that 22,000 people behind the scenes are successfully servicing 8, 9 million credit card orders, that is quite an accomplishment. So that's been my experience. Um, there are people who leave, but again, a uh, sense of purpose is, is very important. Yeah, thank you, Makaran. Uh, by the way, oh, sorry, thank you, Prashant Karnik. Okay. Uh, Prashant has experience with eight startups. Currently, is Senior Vice President and General Manager of Worldwide Client Services. Mr. Karnik holds a bachelor's degree in uh, mechanical engineering from NIT Surat. Also, Mr. Karnik's uh, profile is published on uh, Forbes magazine. So now let us hear from Sanjeev Mukankar. Uh, recently I read in Google, Mr. Page is sending emails directly to the folks who manage people asking what they are doing in order to cut bureaucracy within an organization. So in a clearly large organization there is some level of bureaucracy. How do you manage it and how do you make your team is effective or make sure your team is not affected by bureaucracy. Yeah, the, uh, it is true that the larger the organization becomes, uh, you know, more bureaucracy sets in. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you my experience. Um, my experience in, in becoming successful in, in that kind of organization is really staying close to your people, staying in constant touch, irrespective of uh, the hierarchy. Uh, you know, I've found that uh, if, uh, I mean, there are managers that uh, are so hierarchy oriented that they will only talk to their next level and never talk to the level below. Uh, and uh, in my experience, that thing really never works. So my personal style is I want to be in touch with, you know, almost every engineer that, that works in my group. 
uh, no matter what the size is, uh, you know, at, at some point it becomes, uh, you know, almost unmanageable, but I've been able to do that, you know, for the size of up to, you know, 300 engineers or so. It's hard, but, you know, if you, if you make an attempt to do it, uh, you know, you, you can stay in touch. The more in touch you are uh, with, with the people that are in trenches, uh, the easier it becomes to, to, to cut the bureaucratic thing and, you know, still be effective as a team. Not to mention uh, the fact that, uh, you know, by doing that, uh, the higher you are in the organization, if, if, you, if you get to know, you know, as many people as possible in your organization personally, the commitment that you will get from them just because you know them personally is, is a tremendous payback, right? So they don't then care for you know bureaucracy or formality or anything. So you know having that open door policy where they can feel uh, you know they are free to come and talk to you directly if they, if anything bugs them uh, is is one of the ways of you know cutting through the, the bureaucratic uh, issues that, that larger organizations. Have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, by the way, Sanjeev is a senior director at uh, Cisco Systems. His areas of expertise include ATM switching, high-end routing, voice or IP gateways, <coughs> mobile internet services, security service control engines, and unified communications. Since joining uh, Cisco's uh, services organizations two years ago, Sanjeev has spearheaded the services technology architecture efforts, and he is responsible for driving Cisco services wide uh, technology architecture definition and common services platform initiative. And let's move on to another service uh, executive, is Manish Sina, is a senior, senior vice president at uh, Yahoo. Uh, I have two questions for you. So in a mature company, you have access to various resources to hire uh, folks like recruiting team, university uh, reach programs. How do you build a team? Uh, is it uh, by doing lateral transfers or hiring from outside? And the second question is, how do you motivate your global team? So, I, I don't think um, hiring from outside or hiring from inside, um, actually that doesn't make much of a difference, right? I mean, what you're looking for is um, the right people for the right role. And if that happens to be inside and you can grow them, great. If it happens to be pro uh, there's nobody inside and you have to bring them from the outside, then you know, that's the option you go with, right? Uh, there are advantages of one or the other, right? If, if there's somebody inside, you know who they are, you know what they've accomplished, you know what their capabilities are to a certain extent. Even if they are a different group, different division, different part of the world, you know, there's always a feedback mechanism which you can find out, you can call managers, you can figure out you know, what they've accomplished. So I give them a little bit of an advantage. You know, if I need three things, three skill set for a job, and you have only two, I'll take a risk on you, because you're a proven commodity, right? For, for the outside, you don't have all of those. You know, your friends can talk, your resume can say, but how many times have you hired wrong people? You know, you've made, all made our mistakes, right? Um, so those kind of risks which you take on those people won't be there. But you pretty much have to go with either one of them as a combination. Um, there's always pressure you will get from, from HR and recruiting, you know, grow your people internally and there'll be a very positive message which you send and you know, take some diverse groups and promote the diverse groups. But those are all side effects. You, you put the right person in the uh, right role, if it happens to be from the inside, got an added message. If it happens to be a uh, in a diverse group, you got an added message. But if you start doing it for those reasons, uh, you'll end up with, with a little bit of a problem. And your second question was... Uh, so how do you group. motivate your global team? It's, um, we, we had a long conversation on, uh, on that table, right, for global teams. Um, global teams have very diverse cultural needs. And cultural needs have different diverse uh, impacts which you can make with them, right? So. You know, what you do in Korea, I have a team about 50, 60 people in Korea. What I have to do with them versus the 200 I have in Egypt, it's going to be completely different. Right? But there's two things which I think, uh, both, both which have been already talked about, but those are probably the linchpins which you always do. 
Um, the purpose, I think, Prashant, you talked about, right? It's, it's huge. And you should ask yourself, you know, what do you remember of a job which you did three jobs ago? What do you remember of that? I remember when I was in India, I created this environment and this building which I left. I don't remember how much money I made. I don't remember how many options I got. I don't remember how many times I went to the medical facility and my bills were paid. I don't remember those, but I remember what I created. So I keep telling my people, um, think about the legacy you want to leave behind five years from now and go work on that legacy. You know, you've got the purpose, right? You build your purpose, right? I'll promise you, you know, 10, 15, 20 years later, you will still talk about that piece which was in sight, I mean, uh, in Skype, I built that, right? You may stop talking about you know, the other benefits which came with it, right? But that piece will always be yours. That's your legacy. Talk about any of your jobs you've done. Your legacy is what you have to start building today. And if you know that's the headline I'm going to write and you start writing it, that's the purpose you're building, right? The second thing which, uh, which global teams, which human beings require, I guess, is um, recognition, you know, the ability to go touch and feel people who make decisions. Um, I do not, I was telling you, when I go on my tours, um, I do an international tour almost every other week. And I will never go do a business plan review, a business review, uh, analysis of the business. Those things I don't do when I'm in the field. When I'm in the field, I'm eating with these guys, I'm drinking with them, I'm going out with them. Whether you call it team building or in uh, you know, the American world, whether you call it uh, bar hopping in India, whether you call it, you know, whatever name you want to give it, right? That's what it is. People start growing up and you'll find out more from those kind of events. Then when you come back, you know, do your business review on the phone or Skype or you know, whatever technology you have. It solves the same purpose. You cannot do touch and feel on the phone, on, you know, on electronic media, on uh, Cisco's technology. None of them will give you the chair a drink, right? That's what I do when I'm outside and people will give you so much. Right? So when you have to motivate them, you have to understand what do they want. And the best way to understand what they want is have a beer. Have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving good suggestion. Uh, Manish uh, is responsible for Yahoo's uh, global uh, customer support and overall content moderation initiatives. Uh, he's based in Sunnyvale. And Manish manages a global team of 1,300 employees. And also Manish Sinha is an alumni of NIT Allahabad. Next, let us hear from Manoj Apti. So in a startup, there are uh, times where uh, you feel your company is going nowhere. How do you motivate your team during that phase? It's an excellent question. And uh, very true, actually. So, uh, whether it's a startup as a whole or an employee as one, right? It's you start off and about six months or one year out, it's the worst trenches, right? Where you're building, 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 and it's like oh, nothing is going to come out of this, right? So uh, one of the things that I used to do very regularly is talk to everyone, right? Because as the leader of the company, you can see further, you have more access, you talk to more people. At that point, there is no money coming in. All I've done is talk to five banks and I've talked to six ISPs and uh, everybody's saying, yeah, this looks interesting. At that point, it is very critical to come back and keep talking to your people about, hey, you know, there's no money coming, but here's what these guys said, right? We showed them these PowerPoints and they love it. And they ask questions and you have to get back to them with the answers to the questions from the customer, right? Uh, my, my role in uh, Zsk, actually I should give you a quick uh, idea about what we do. So uh, I run product management for a company called Zscaler. Zscaler is a security as a service provider. We uh, provide, uh, we have a global cloud and we provide security as a service to large enterprises. Uh, rather than deploying boxes, they use our cloud to serve the internet essentially. So uh, when we started building this, this was especially true for us because until we had 50 data centers across the world, we couldn't really go to the large guys that we were all talking about as the startup saying, we'll have these big massive companies as our customers, it was all on paper. 
And so to keep the team motivated on showing them that, right, you have to first get one or two interesting successes. We actually had uh, the CIO of a very large uh, uh, bottling company, let's say, uh, visit us and talk to the team about when you build this, I will buy, right? And it takes a lot to, uh, uh, through your friends, through your technology, through convincing champions, through convincing analysts to bring them in and talk about what you are doing is interesting to the world. Once you get success number one, two, and three, then it just goes through the roof, right? So then, then the engineering team starts seeing what it is. And the issue is more complex, and I was asking Sanjeev about that a little while ago, on keeping a remote team motivated, because teams here actually get to see that, right? People are coming in the HQ, there are, oh, that guy was from this ISP and blah, great. But what about the guys in India and in China? They don't see any of it. So for, as you said, going out, visiting, and visiting not to say, how much have you done today, right? Just to go chill, give them stories about life and what things are happening out there is very, very important. It takes about a year of that to get you somewhere. And once you are past that hard crunch year, life is much better. Then it's a lot of bug fixing. <laughs> so that would be my short. Yeah, thank you, Manoj. Uh, uh, Manoj did uh, introduce himself. He is a VP uh, product management at uh, Zscaler. It's a cloud security company. And by the way, one of Anatian is working at uh, Zscaler. He was the one who introduced us to Manoj and uh, Gururaj. And they are hiring. If you are interested in cloud security space, I think that's a company you can approach. Again, they have a stringent procedure. Uh, <laughs> it's not a cakewalk, okay? <laughs> Okay, and Manoj ran engineering and PM for first two years, and prior to that, like Manoj was at uh, Juniper for nine years in various roles. He did his uh, PhD in computer science, and uh, he did his BTEC at IIT Mumbai, Mumbai or Bombay. Uh, yeah, we, we know as Bombay, now it has changed to Mumbai. So now I would uh, like to open up uh, questions for all the NITs and ISCs who have attended today. So any questions? Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, ready. Yeah. Go ahead. So this this question is open to anyone of you who would like to answer. We have talked a lot about what makes a strong team. I'd like to know, in your based on your experience, which is the biggest factor that could break a team? What 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 are the factors that could that, that will make you say, okay, this team is not going to work. So Prashant, you want to take? You have experience of eight startups. I think uh, we talked about, the, you know, I have a firm believer in purpose. Uh, if the management team is not honest about their failures and what is going on, uh, the team essentially loses faith in you. Second is, um, you, if you have a tendency to throw the team in front of a bus, um, that doesn't go well. VCs will come in and tell you that um, things are not going well, and you start blaming the team that I have horrible programmers and horrible leaders. That doesn't go well if the word really reaches that you have been uh, trying to <coughs> protect yourself by throwing the team. Uh, in front of the sharks, as I call them, uh, it doesn't go well. So those are some of the things. Uh, another thing is, um, if you look at uh, some false expectations that you set with the team, you tell the team that if you finish so much of work that you know they, these are the rewards that we will be uh, promising to you, um, they can be forgiving a few times. But if that happens to me on a repetitious basis, they lose faith in you and you see the team starting to disintegrate. But those are my experiences. So next question. You seem to have a question. So when you are building the initial team, when you're hiring, you know, going through the hiring process, what kind of, you know, core DNA you guys look for? You know, just, just to 
you know, something, uh, what I've seen is different people have different perspective. You know, people look for similar background and then people look for a little bit people not having that similar background but more wide variety experience. Anything that you guys have to say on that? I think the, the biggest thing you can do when you're starting and really starting, like you said, you know, you have three or four people, you really do need to look at the team that is going to gel together. Because a team that is together will work and back each other up and, you know, work through the late nights and go through the, uh, you know, uh, phases together to reach to the next level. So at each different stage, you're looking for different kind of people. So initial stages, you're really looking for people who are willing to put in the hard work, work together, are coming from very similar, you know, uh, motivation factors that, you know, they are really in that initial stage startup mode. They really are not looking at the stability part of it, but really are looking for the excitement part of it. As you go to the later stages when the funding is there and, you know, you have a much bigger team, your challenges are different and you really need to look at how you're going to meet those challenges of growing the team to the next level, taking taking a team of 12, 20, 30 people to 60, 70, 80 people. Your original leaders may not be the right choices at that point, and you need to find what motivates them and keep them motivated by making sure that they can continue to add value where they have been adding value while you build and grow the team to provide the next level of leadership to take the team and the organization to the next level. And the one more thing to add to it is people who can scale. When you, you know, when you have an initial team, everybody is coding or everybody is doing development. But as you grow up, these people will become managers or you know, lead architects for a specific reason. So that is another thing that I found. If all the people are scaling, then there is less conflict. You know. Yeah, the key the key thing is really to find out what motivates that person. Yes. I've often found that uh, if if you if you really go and talk to the people, and multiple of us have said that you really have to engage with the people at different levels. You really need to understand what motivates them, what drives them. And if they're looking to lead a team or manage a team just for the growth, then it's the wrong choice. You really have to go to the next level and say. How can I create the environment necessary for this person to continue to contribute? It could be a CTO's office, for example. It could be an architect role. You need to find that role and define the role in your organization. Yeah. My point was people who can scale. You know, and typically when you have an original team, you have people working. These are all individual contributors. But then people, if people are capable of scaling, everybody scales, then what I have seen is the conflict among the team is less because everybody can mature, you know, to the next level. And hence, you can have the second level of leadership ready when you when you tend to scale. That's my, my personal experience on this. Okay. You know, um, by the way, I need to make a correction. I haven't done eight startups, just two, so. <laughs> um, two big ones. Um, well, not really, but. Let me, let me, I'm working for a company that we're having this problem. Everybody feels they have an entitlement to get promoted. Okay? Now, I will give you the example of a company that overcame this very successfully was Sun. If you look at the leaders in Sun, McKinley made a decision, I'm not going to substitute experience. Okay? People have to realize that. So Sun had the best of talent from Hewlett Packard, then at that time DEC and IBM. So when we went into a sales situation, I was with the Hewlett Packard, they exactly knew how HP was going to react. And Sun won every single time. So as the company grows, you want to really expand your footprint and you want you want real road warriors who can make it happen, even in the engineering ranks. And for example, you just let's talk about QA. Every engineer feels QA is not necessary. You know, like my code doesn't have any problems. <laughs> yeah. So then what you do is you take somebody who is very sharp, who is very critical, and you make him the QA manager. And long behold, this person does not know what the QA practices are in other companies. Now, I work for a company in Israel that has all their operation in Israel. And we just hired a QA manager from another Israeli company. 
And the guy came in and it was just amazing that within six months, our, the quality of product has dramatically improved because we had promoted an, an earlier guy who had no clue of what happens outside. So that is something that people have to come to grips with. Yes, everybody is ambitious, everybody wants to you know, take the next step. But in reality, sometimes that is a recipe for, for failure, in, just from based on my experience. Uh, I will share a perspective which worked for me and the last uh, uh, few jobs I had. In the 45 minutes of interview time, I usually assess like how fast the person who is interviewing is digesting the new information I am giving him. Not what you did in the past. I am going to give you some new information. There is always something new going on in the business. And I try to play it out to them. And if they can digest it very fast, and think and respond back with creative solutions. Those are the kind of people I usually like to keep them as leaders in the organizations. And they seem to have done well in almost every job I had so far. Yeah, good point. Next question. Take it uh, my question is, as you move along the leadership, how do you still manage this personal connection? I mean, you need to be, at, you need to know how they're doing to motivate them. Right? And you probably have 10 minutes per employee in s six months, and you still have to make an impression. What are some of the best practices that, that worked for you, what didn't work for you? Could you share? Yeah, I think um, in my experience, you have to use every opportunity that you get to, to create and maintain that connection. And uh, you know, there are things like, sometimes I you know, go to the break room for a coffee and you know, I see an employee and I just spend two minutes, no more, two minutes talking about what they are doing. You know, just sometimes it's even things about life, right? you know, hobbies they have or, or something. It doesn't have to be always work-related. Uh, so I think using every opportunity that you get, you know, whether it is in, you know, you, you bump uh, against each other in a break room or, you know, you have a, a meeting where, where you see them, I think you need to keep on collecting those data points and, you know, keep it in, in, in your database. Um, the other thing, other good source for, you know, especially if you have, you know, multiple layers within your organization um, are the managers of those people, right? I mean, they are usually a very good source of information about each individual employees. And you need to take time to, you know, discuss those things, right? Uh, you know, the higher you go in the organization, the more important it is for you to really have a good pulse of your organization. And you should be spending a lot more time in, you know, knowing the employees, keeping that connection. So, you know, again, my, my experience is use every opportunity that you get and have the elephant's memory, right? So keep those little pieces of data, like, you know, somebody plays tennis, right? So you meet the person a year later and say, hey, how is your, ten how is your tennis going? Oh, you remember that? You know, that, that's, that's what keeps that connection, right? So, uh, I agree that you don't have Three hundred people working for me, so uh, it's not that bad for me. But I have a different, uh, similar issue. Right? I speak to numerous customers, numerous sales guys, numerous people in the field, and so no, I don't have an elephant's memory. So I will tell you my trick. My trick is I go back and write. Right? <laughs> for every contact that I have, I have a little note saying what did I talk about and why, right? And it just keeps me at my memory job. Now, absolutely, if I run, I run into him in a gym. I have the worst memory. I will not remember people's name all day long, right? So uh, then I have to figure it out on the fly. And that, that's a knack that you have to develop. But if you're going into a meeting, you're going into an engineering meeting, or you're going into a sales meeting, doing a quick check of life from what, the, what had I talked about, and making that connection the first time you talk is very important. It is critical. What Sanjeev is able to do is fantastic. I can't, so I take notes. <laughs> so, yes, there's a trick to it, but you have to be diligent about it. 
Fortunately, we have the smartphones and all the, all the, all the things nowadays, so you can make a quick note. Every note is the, uh, the other thing, by the way, is using the social networking nowadays, right? Yes. Uh, if you can create the groups, you know, for, for your work group and keep in touch with each other, I mean, that's, that's another way. A lot of people like using, you know, Facebook or, you know, those kind of social media. So, you know, if you if you don't remember it so well, then use those things where, where the things are pretty well documented. Yeah, so, uh, what you're hearing from both of them, if you generalize, is you, you're trying to figure out, as you're going up the org, um, your number of hours is not changing, the criticality of the work you're doing is not changing, none of them is changing. But what is changing is the top two or three things which you focus on. There's only two or three things you can focus on, right? The criticality of people becomes more and more. When I ran eight people, you know, I was spending probably five, ten, ten percent of my time on people, on people-related issues. Today, with 1,200, I'll tell you, I spend more than 50 percent of my time as people. Whether it is formal meetings, whether it is um, just meet them, you know, when we are eating, drinking, whether it is um, coffee uh, conversations, or even interviews. An engineer coming into my org, I will interview every engineer coming in. Now, by the time the decision is already made, my manager has given the decision. They actually send me the uh, offer letter along with the, uh, you know, the uh, interviews, right? They have already made the decision, so they feel empowered. But the person I'm interviewing with gets the hit of I interviewed with the VP before I got uh, offered. That's just the pride that people go away with is huge, right? So 50%, more than 50% of my time is people. That's, I have made that as my priority number one. The managers do my work. Most of my directors, I trust them, they do the work, right? And I empower them, they will do the work. So you have to decide what, the, what your priority number one is. And if it's people, then spend the time on it. Uh, my question is to you, Raman. Uh, uh, in terms of your startup, you mentioned some timelines for your, your company uh, before it had successful exit uh, scenario. Uh, you mentioned 2006 is when you, you, you started this idea, and 2011 is when you, when you got that exit strategy back, right? Now, five years is a pretty long time uh, in Bavaria. Uh, what kept kept you motivated for that entire five years event? That that you know that, that kept you and your whole team going for entire five years until you, you got to that point where you know, it, it blossomed and it came to the fruition. In the course of five years, you know, the team started with three people and ended up with like 70 plus people. You know. What kept us motivated was getting video out of cell phones is very hard. Capturing video is hard. Squeezing the bits and sending on the airwaves is even harder. And sending them reliably and getting the video across to other person is even harder. So the technical complexity of the problem kept me motivated and other co-founders. Then the rest of the team, the main is product management, marketing, and the business development people. They're really excited because of crafting a business model that's required in the mobile ecosystem it was non-trivial. Non-trivial even today. We just cracked one part of it. So that kept them motivated. Then lastly, personally for me, the fear of failure also kept me motivated. I don't want to fail this one, you know, to run next level. So he, so all those three things, the complexity of the problem we are trying to solve, mobile phones are so pervasive in the world, getting video is extremely hard, so how do we crack this nut? I want to solve it. Second thing is, how do we make money in this place for solving this complex problem? And third thing was like the fear of failure. All three kept us going for five years. And we didn't, I mean we paid also, also you know, we raised about $60 million of venture money and you know, we are making good money last year. You know. So there was funds all through, like we didn't starve ourselves, you know, to solve the problem, we didn't pay ourselves to, yeah. 
Okay, next question. Does anyone want to answer the same question? I think like you are also in a startup mode. Uh, uh, so, but we are not there yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and in fact, uh, uh, ours is a little different uh, in terms of, uh, but, but the points that he made, right? Having a hard problem to solve and solving it in a very different way from others and showing that you are doing it different gets the team motivated. Where, uh, uh, where others are talking about uh, a few milliseconds of latency being acceptable as a web proxy, when we say, no, 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 the team is a fail if we don't talk about microseconds and we are able to show that. That's a tremendous motivation to the team, right? When you can show, hey, we are just pumping packets through and you know, within microseconds finding viruses. There is no market value, immediate value to it other than showing graphs to the engineering team. But you see that happen and the engineers are like, yes, we did it. Right? It's just about doing it. Or being able to show that you are, you are taking terabytes of logs and being able to store it. All fake in the QA lab, but being able to do it. right? Setting milestones that make sense to the internal team that show our differentiation from what the rest of the world is doing and making those check marks saying, okay, we hit that, we hit that, we hit that. No real milestones outside, just for our own good, right? Makes a big deal. And then you have to celebrate, right? As he said, you didn't starve yourselves. You don't starve yourself. We are starving ourselves, by the way. We didn't take any money. So we kind of starve ourselves, but then we reserve our money for that great celebration, right? Uh, uh, my boss will drink shatter. He doesn't drink, but he'll drink a small bit of champagne every time we hit that milestone. So doing those kinds of things, right, that keeps the team going, right, on, okay, we have the next target. You can't set the next target to IPO, then everybody will die. You have to, uh, if you, you have to think of running a marathon. When you talk to anybody who's running a marathon, they'll say, yeah, our target is set to the next mile, right? So keep those milestones in front of you, then you can hit that. Then it just becomes regular stuff, and then suddenly like, wow, we are there. That's the idea. Uh, I have one more comment. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think Manish talked about you know, getting involved. I think it's very clear that you have to travel around the world and really get involved with the employees. But you have to be very careful that you're not perceived as a bullshitter <laughs> who comes in and shakes hands and likes to you know enjoy company money. So I have a complete management philosophy. You go out and you calm the trouble. But you trouble the calm. Okay, people sitting around, you kind of probe around and try and find out. I think that works when people realize that folks are coming here, they, they're concerned about us, but they're also concerned about the business. Uh, because in my career, I've seen many executives who just come around and you know give a very broad smile and, and talk about good things, but and they, they fly out. So um, one time an employee said, he's like a bird. He comes around, shits around, and flies up. <laughs> so uh, you don't want to do that either. <laughs> yeah, I have one question. Uh, especially in uh, various startups, one observation that I've been uh, seeing is good number of startups uh, have uh, engineering presence outside US now, either in India, China, or Eastern Europe. Uh, what kind of strategies you are using especially if you are planning to expand your operations in India, uh, in hiring the best talented people. In India, the culture is work only for branded companies. If they don't know, uh, they are not going to uh, join. And the other biggest problem is for the young generation, especially in the uh, age group of 20s, in order to uh, get a good bride, they need to be working in a branded company. If they work in a startup, they are not going to get good bride. So how do you Hire the talented people. <laughs> so yeah, so we have no brand, right? or think have. We are starting to build a brand now. Um, so very true, especially in a city like Bangalore. Our team was 50-50, uh, still is 50-50 approximately here and in Bangalore. And then hiring somebody in Bangalore who's a star is always hard because uh, an IBM offer is like. But it's IBM or a Cisco, right? How, what is this Zscaler thing? So we had that problem for a little bit. Um, the initial 
think those started with hiring a core team that knows others, just as you pointed out, right? Those guys bring in the other core. So getting to six, eight, ten people is not that hard because you start with a team that knows other guys and you get there. The next stage over is really hard. We lucked out, quite honestly. We brought a brand. So uh, we had uh, Mr. Dilakaran, who was the chief technology officer of uh, Wipro. He was the founder of Wipro. Join us as our MD for India. So then he would call. We never called. And getting a call from Mr. Divakaran in Bangalore got an interview right away. Right. So that helped. But uh, outside of that, uh, having uh, in terms of building the team and building that and uh, uh, in the team, it is about each one of us going to India and spending time there. There is no alternative to staying there. Right. You go there. You stay for three four weeks and then you come back stay three, four weeks here. It takes a lot of toll on the management team and our family lives, but that's given. Right? That's If you want to start that, you have to be there, no questions. And it is hard. It feels interesting to begin with, but it becomes really difficult over time. Um, the other thing that we also started doing was bringing a couple of engineers to the US every once in a while. Right? Once a year, each one of them has to come here. So that they sit with the team here, they get to know the team here. Uh, half the team here is Indian anyway, so they don't really need to go back. But getting those guys here and having them get the feel of what HQ is makes a big difference. So it's mixing people up. And yeah, I'm sure uh, uh, video conferencing could have helped, but uh, we believe far more in the face-to-face -face and whiteboard. It's a startup. It's hard to do it without a whiteboard and a face-to-face uh, uh, -face conversation. So we used to focus on, we would also make sure that our releases are focused that way. That the team would come here and the release would be focused around that area. So they would sit with the CTO and the CEO and the product management and figure it all out, get stuff going, and then they would go back on motivated, pumped up to finish, right? That way it starts working, but you have to be very, very close to that team in India because otherwise it's always, there's a very basic Thing that happens in India always. It's like, oh, we are given the grunt work. You have to break that mold because every time that you hire somebody from outside, they come from an environment. Even when we hire from a Wipro, Wipro guys think, oh, we, we are just given the grunt work. So you have to change that mold. That actually, if the rest of your employees start believing, becomes your biggest asset in selling to new employees. That's why they join. Because they hear from all the other guys they interviewed with that this was fantastic, and they'll be like, ah, oh, maybe that's a difference. That's one thing. So yeah, even even though I'm with a big company now, we did exactly that. Uh, so the gemstone, we actually uh, seeded uh, Pune operations, uh, just exactly like uh, he's saying. Uh, trips, major trips from all levels of management being there and uh, providing the work. In fact. Uh, we never differentiated between the team out here and team out there in terms of what work they are doing. We had same SVN, everybody is checking into the same stuff. You break the bill, you take the uh, grunt work and stay up the night and fix the bill before <laughs> you go home. So when you, when you instill that, that we are treating you exactly the same, you are part of this big team, that gives them the feeling that this is different because yeah, true, uh, that in India, uh, when people first came, they were looking for the brand, but once you got the few key engineers who actually saw that they are really getting to do the real key work that they never get to do outside, they st stick around. They, are, they have engineers who have been there for a long, long time, and they draw the other people because they start talking about how, what kind of stuff they are doing. In fact, the team in India keeps telling us that they are here because they get to do all this cool stuff, which they will never get to do outside. And and things are changing. I mean, five, six years back, product companies were unheard of today. A lot of a lot more product companies. We used to face a lot of other challenges because if I'm in a big company, I'm gonna get promoted to a manager and I'll be managing fifty people. And we had to just fight that saying, Well, this is a product company. Teams are not more than four people. You know, you need to realize that. And the third thing is, of course, bringing them right here. Because once they see here that you know there are engineers who are building their career 15, 20, 30 years, 
they're just doing engineering and they're not trying to look for how do I become a manager. They realize there is a potential in doing and being passionate about just building the product rather than trying to look for you know, a management role. And they really value that. Because and, and that's coming in India. Right now there are people who are looking for architecture roles, they're looking for being a lead developer. They're no longer looking for saying, no, I want to be the manager, because that used to be the default. So last question before we wrap up. Yeah. You are playing a difficult one. Uh, how do you handle it's okay. uh, your how do you keep your team together during difficult times? Uh, let's say you know the funding is not coming for some reason. You have lost uh, lead in technology, you are building a product. These are difficult times for any team, uh, any project. So what all you do to keep the team together and preventing it from disintegrating? Yeah, I just want to add the uh, comment to the last round. You know, how do I? I had a team in Moscow, Russia. When I was at Oracle, I had teams in India. But this time around, we had a team in Moscow, Russia. Uh, one of the things which I think the both gentlemen mentioned, I did. We did all of those, but we also, I'm sure they must have done it too. We also made sure the parity in equity compensation as the people come on board for early employees. It's just the standard rules of thumbs, you know, how these things work. Uh, we made sure they are just exactly identical. The salaries are different, you know. In Russia, you pay in rubles, you know, stuff like that, you know. Made sure it's comparable to that uh, country. But I made sure, like, the equity part of it is comparable. So when we had the exit, they all realized the value of it. And I think that was a, a, it's a great feeling for all of us, you know, for having done the play very well. You know, we didn't take advantage of anyone anywhere in the world. It's a very good feeling for us. Now, coming to this question of like, how do we keep team motivated when we uh, lost a key deal, you know? We lost a key deal, you know? In fact, yesterday's just go click, uh, kill flip, you know? Flip was a, a, a small change of revenue for us too, you know? So these things happen every time in the business, right? The key guy leaves, right, you know? Uh, key graphic designer leaves, you know? Stuff like that. So the two things I did all the time, right? One was like, you know, we were, really upfront, the person left, it's nothing, and be as fast as to share as possible. Don't let the great point take the news to them. Be the first person to announce to them. It's hard news, right? People understand people have to leave because of the personal reasons, for economic reasons, you know? There are other reasons why people leave the company, right? Fit and all those stuff, right? It's fine, you know? Let them understand it. And second thing is, uh, that's a time you get in front of the employees, you can be upfront with them, like, you know, what is good in the company and what is not working. How we are trying to fix the what's not working. So that's the second thing which I, we also did uh, throughout the five years. Whenever we had an opportunity to get in front of all the employees, this is what we did. Last comment. I think that, that is an excellent question. And, um, there's really no, uh, no set formula or answer. Um, it's like a family, you know. If there is a calamity in a family, you look to the elders to really carve out and pain what maybe there is, you know, comfort in the future. And the employees are going to look to the management team to say, how are you going to really solve the problem you have? I mean, as I said, I work for a company that had total reliance on the financial industry. And the financial industry went through a meltdown. What do we do? And so, employees, you know, I mean, they're not going to leave overnight. They're dis, you know, they're disgruntled. Uh, they were on projects that got cancelled. What are you going to do? And our CEO stepped out and said, there is actually applicability to what we do in the telco space. And that's a new market we're going to go after. Give me six months. And there was a plan on how we would attack the market. And the, the biggest win we had was Vodafone in 18 countries. And then the employees said, yeah, these people can think out of the box and go after something that, you know, will keep the market alive. So that's another example. So they always look for, okay, you know, we have a calamity, but what are you going to do? Okay. So I would like to thank all the panel members for giving uh, valuable insights. Uh, please give them a big applause. So now I would like uh, 
Tana uh, convener Satish Gauru and uh, Srinivas uh, Atluri who is uh, NIT uh, Warangal uh, president and also Tana alumni uh, chairman to come forward and uh, give an update on the Tana activities. Tana stands for Telugu Association of Northern America. Uh, thank you very much for all the panel speakers today. That was a great insight. And uh, today, I guess the, the emphasis was on people and networks.